It's big, it's bright, and you definitely shouldn't look at it. And this is your Space Pod for May 25th, 2016. If you're unaware of what I'm talking about, you really need to get outside every once in a while. Of course, it's the sun, and it's that big angry ball of gas that we have in the sky that lights up the day here on Earth. And it's actually very important to everything here on Earth. But what exactly makes the sun the sun? Ask a lot of people where the closest star to Earth is, and many will answer Proxima Centauri, which is correct if you're excluding the sun. But just what makes a star like our sun a star? The key to that answer? Balance. The sheer mass of a star allows unbelievable pressures and temperatures to exist at its core. This is what allows for the process of nuclear fusion. Our sun is taking the hydrogen it is made up of and smashing that together to make helium, some heavier elements, and energy. That outward push would completely annihilate the sun were it not for the gravitational pull of all of that mass aiming inwards. A star is then, very simply, a balance of the outward force of nuclear fusion and the inward pull of gravity. Our sun is about 109 times the diameter of the Earth, roughly 1.3 million kilometers across, and its volume could hold over a million Earths inside of it. The core of the sun is an unimaginable place. 15 million degrees Celsius, 150 times denser than water, rotating faster than the interior layers above it, 99% of all the energy output of the sun comes from the core, which takes up roughly a quarter of the interior's radius. Every single second, 4 million tons of matter are converted into energy. The radiative zone comes next, extending out from the core to three quarters of the way to the surface. It gains its name from the fact that thermal radiation is what drives the energy in this part of the sun. The temperature here drops to 7 million degrees Celsius and continues to cool the further the distance is from the core, down to 2 million degrees Celsius. A thin transition layer called the Taclocene is next, separating the radiative zone from the convective zone. Not much is known about this area of the sun, but current hypotheses is that this area, from the interaction of the radiative and convection zones, the magnetic field of the sun is generated. The convective zone is next, and it continues all the way up to just below the surface. In this area, radiation goes through the process of convection, rising plasma up to help release the energy before it dips back down in the convective currents. Columns of thermal convection generate what are known as granules on the surface of the sun. Each of these, on average, is roughly the size of Texas. The visible surface of the sun is known as the photosphere. This is where the visible light that our eyes can see leaves the sun. Sunspots can be seen in this layer. Those are areas where the sun's intense magnetic field has lowered the density of the gas. And with the lower density comes lower temperature. And with the lower temperature comes less light output. And compared to the rest of the sun, you see a dark area. Now, on average, the photosphere is at about 5,700 degrees Celsius, while sunspots, they're relatively cooler, somewhere around 2,700 to 4,000 degrees Celsius. Above it lay the chromosphere, an area where the temperature spikes to nearly 20,000 degrees Celsius, and above that lay a thin transition region, where the temperature skyrockets even further to a blistering million degrees Celsius, caused by the simple process of ionization of helium. The corona lay above, most prominently seen during solar eclipses as that white halo around the moon. Considered to be the extended upper atmosphere of the sun, it can average up to 2 million degrees Celsius, but it has been seen to spike anywhere from 8 to 20 million degrees Celsius. As to why the upper layers of the sun seem to be hotter than the surface, no fully complete theory explains it, but scientists, they're working on it. The sun is currently about 4.6 billion years old and into its main sequence phase, which you could describe as adulthood for stars. And that will continue for about another 4 to 5 billion years, at which point it'll run out of fuel to fuse, swell up into a red giant, puff off its outer layers, making a beautiful planetary nebula, and leave behind a white dwarf. Now, there's a very big debate amongst astronomers as to whether the sun will swell outwards enough in its red giant phase as to whether it will get close to the Earth or consume the Earth. I say, either way, we're toast. 
The average distance between the Earth and the Sun is about 149 million kilometers, and at the speed of light nearly 300,000 kilometers per second, it still takes light about 8 minutes and 19 seconds to traverse that distance. Now, as the Earth orbits the Sun, it'll actually have a point where it's closest to the Sun and a point where it's furthest from the Sun. Now, the point closest to the Sun, that we call perihelion, actually occurs in January. And the point furthest from the Sun, which we call aphelion, occurs in July, much to the surprise of everyone. Thanks for watching this space pod. I'm Jared Head. Don't forget to let us know what you think down in the comments below. And also don't forget to like and subscribe to us on social media. And we can't do these space pods without the awesome people who help crowdfund our shows on Patreon. These folks are the ones who have actually helped us directly by funding our shows. So a big shout out to all of these people. And if you would like to help contribute to these shows, you can visit patreon.com slash space pod. So until the next space pod, keep exploring. <laughs>